as we open up Esther. It's just before Job and the Psalms. Esther chapter 5. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall, facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Then the king asked, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom it will be given you. If it pleases the king, replied Esther, let the king, together with Haman, come today to a banquet I have prepared for him. Bring Haman at once, the king said, so that we may do what Esther asks. So the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared. As they were drinking wine, the king again asked Esther, Now what is your petition? It will be given you. And what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom it will be granted. Esther replied, My petition and my request is this. If the king rewards me with favour, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfil my request... Let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet I will prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. Haman went out that day happy and in high spirits. But when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that he either neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, he was filled with rage against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. Calling together his friends and Zeresh, his wife, Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, and all the ways the king had honoured him and how he had elevated him above the other nobles and officials. And that's not all, Haman added. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave, and she has invited me along with the king tomorrow. But all this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. His wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Have a gallows built, 75 feet high, and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then go with the king to the dinner and be happy. This suggestion delighted Hammond, and he had the gallows built. This is God's word. I'm preparing for this, I almost got ahead of myself and got onto chapter 6. In a sense, you could do chapters 5 and 6 together, um, because they do kind of make a whole, but we'll slow it down a little. Let's pray. Oh, Father, it is a wonderful privilege to be able to be here tonight. We thank you for the way in which you have brought us to yourself. We thank you for the fellowship we can enjoy with you and with each other. We thank you for the way that you watch over us, the way that you guide and lead us, the way that you are involved in every part of our lives. And we thank you that your word is a wonderful way in which we can get to know you more intimately, more personally. We know that these stories we have here are not just for our purview, not just so that we can read them and move on, but so that we can get to know you better and understand who you are. And so as we read them, we pray that we would always see what you are doing in the background. And we ask this evening that as we seek to understand your word to us tonight, you would give us insight. And we pray that you would move our hearts and minds this evening, for Jesus' sake. Amen. I read a rather amusing story that, uh, of a young seminarian who had finished his Bible training at college 
and had gone to a church as the first time as a pastor, and it's very difficult when you stand up for the first time and preach. Anyway, he was preaching his first sermon at his home church, and after three years, he felt quite adequately prepared, and when he was introduced to the congregation, he walked boldly into the pulpit, head high, radiating self-confidence. But he stumbled reading the scriptures and then lost his train of thought halfway through the message. He began to panic, and so he did the safest thing. He quickly ended the message, prayed, and walked dejectedly from the pulpit, his head down, his self-assurance shattered. Later, one of the godly elders whispered to the embarrassed young man, if you had gone up to the pulpit in the same way you came down, you might have come down the way you went up. The elder was right. God resists the proud, but gives great grace to the humble. This is a story about a contrast. And it's quite obvious to see the contrast is between wisdom and folly. And what we're going to see is that for Haman, pride comes before a fall. He's going to fall spectacularly in the next chapter. This is the preceding chapter that kind of builds the narrative tension and sets him up for what is to come. And as we see the way the narrator weaves uh, his magic through this chapter, we will notice how he's going to take Esther and show her and show her to us as one who embodies godly wisdom. And she is going to be contrasted with Haman, who is an absolute fool as far as, the, as far as the scriptures are concerned. And so as we read through this, there's a wonderful lesson for us to learn what wisdom looks like and what folly looks like, what to embrace and what to avoid. So come with me as we go to the text, because all of us need help in these areas. Firstly, I want you to notice the character of wisdom, verses 1 to 8. The character of wisdom it demonstrates great courage. Look at verse, uh, verse 1 onwards. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. The previous chapter sets us up for this by reminding us that for Esther to go into the presence of the king meant that she was putting her life on the line. And in order to do that, she's already spent three days in mourning and fasting. She's come out of that mourning and fasting and has prepared herself now to enter into the very courtroom of the king. She does so not knowing the outcome. Now, the problem with this text is that you and I read it knowing the outcome, don't we? We know it's going to work out. We know she's going to be fine. We know the king's going to extend, extend the scepter to her. So there's a sense in which the courage she displays is lost a little bit like us. But let me try and paint a different scenario to try and put it in context in which we live. Imagine for a moment... And particularly if you're a young woman here, unmarried, imagine for a moment that you are in the Middle East somewhere, and you are in one of those kingdoms that is controlled by a emperor, a sovereign ruler, and you have been brought into this harem of his, where he's got a whole lot of women at his beck and call. Now, this still happens in certain Middle Eastern countries. And you know that if you enter into that king's presence without him soliciting you, it might cost you your life. How would you react? How would you respond? For Esther doesn't know at this point. And she enters into this courtroom with everything on the line. That requires great courage, doesn't it? And sometimes our faith is required to exercise great courage. And wisdom knows the difference when to be courageous and when not to be courageous. And Esther has realized after spending some time in prayer and fasting 
that the whole nation is now looking to her and that God has raised her up and God has thrust her into this position. She's not there by fluke. But in eternity past, God had determined in his sovereignty to ensure that he would put someone right in the center of the palace so that when his people came under threat, he would have someone ready and willing to go into the king's presence. But you've still got to be ready and willing. And Esther demonstrates incredible courage. Notice how the king offers his scepter to her, and then listen to what he says. Now, this is part of the court language. Then the king asked, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom it will be given to you. Now, that's not to be taken literally. He's not going to hand half the kingdom to her if Esther says, I want half the kingdom. That's just a, a way of trying to say, I will be generous with whatever you ask. And whatever you ask, I will give to you. So ask away. Don't be afraid to ask me what you want. And we have Esther now in the presence of the king, having been given this opportunity to present her case. She doesn't present it immediately. And I think there's purpose in what she's doing, as we will see. But I think what I want you to see initially is that God is showing us what a Christian looks like when they exercise great courage, when called upon by God. Because she has been commissioned by Mordecai, has she not? Mordecai has entered into a discussion with her previously and said to Esther, you are here for a purpose. Now fulfill your purpose. And with godly wisdom, she takes up the mantle. And she displays incredible courage. It's extraordinary for a young woman to show such courage in that society. And it points us forward to the Lord Jesus Christ, does it not? Who also exercised great courage under great pressure when he was praying agonizingly in the Garden of Gethsemane just prior to his death. It reminds us that even though Jesus prays and says, is there any other way? He knows the only way, ultimately, is in submission to the will of God. And so wisdom prevails. And Jesus utters those well-known words, not my will, but yours be done. And so when you and I are faced in similar situations where we have the opportunity of either hearing the voice of God and listening to the voice of God and wisely obeying the voice of God, how will we respond? Will we be an Esther and show courage if that's what is required? Or will we buckle under the pressure? It also shows us that her courage is mixed with incredible humility. And this is seen in the way in which she approaches the king. She dresses appropriately. Now, just think about that for a moment. What has the previous chapter told you? It's told you that she's been praying and she's been mourning. So in spite of the mourning that's going on within her soul, because the very survival of her nation is now contingent upon her being accepted by the king, she dresses in a way that hides that mourning in a way that doesn't demonstrate her soul is at great, in great turmoil. She doesn't, when she enters the king's presence, try and push her way forward. She doesn't try and address the king in unhelpful ways, but she approaches him humbly, recognizing that she is dependent upon his generosity. And so, as we think about ourselves... There should always be humility accompanied with our wisdom. You see, it's very easy to stand courageously upon what God wants us to do. It's very easy to insist on obeying God. But how we do that and how we communicate that, particularly to a lost and dying world, is so very important, is it not? We can either come across as proud and arrogant, or we can come across as humble as we submit ourselves to God and stand upon obeying his word when confronted with a sticky situation. 
Stepping out in faith doesn't simply mean being bombastic, doesn't mean simply being difficult, doesn't mean simply causing trouble for the sake of causing trouble because we standing on our convictions. You need to stand on your convictions, but we should always do it with great grace and humility rather than with pride and arrogance. And we see this even in Christ when he is questioned in Pilate, uh, by Pilate, and plied again and again, he acts and answers with great humility. He doesn't falter. He doesn't compromise. He doesn't go back on what he knows he has to do, but he acts in a way that doesn't bring God's name into dishonor. Sometimes Christians, with perhaps right motivations, seek to stand upon convictions, but in ways that do more damage than good for the sake of Christ because of the aggressive way in which they act. He has a great lesson in humility. Wisdom also exhibits great tact. It's one thing to appear before the king. It's another thing to speak tactfully before this king. And to speak wisely before the king. Now it becomes quite clear in this narrative that Esther has thought very carefully about how she is going to handle the situation. This isn't just an off-the-cuff kind of response now that I'm in the presence of the king. And that's seen by the fact that she doesn't directly answer the king's question. Look, let's read on. If it pleases the king, replied Esther. So he says, what is your request? Now look how she answers. If it pleases the king, replied Esther, let the king together with Haman come today to a banquet I've prepared for him. So there's no direct answer yet. She's acting with tact. In other words, she's trying to say to the king, look, let's, I want to deal with an issue, but I don't want to deal with it in a public setting. And the reason that she doesn't want to deal with it in a public setting is it may cause some level of embarrassment in the king's presence. So rather than do that, she would have a private setting where she can deal with it in a relaxed atmosphere, where she can raise the issue in front of the king. But she's not going to do it immediately, is she? Bring Haman at once, the king said, so that, he may do, that we may do all that Esther asks. So the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared. As they were drinking wine, the king again asked Esther, second time, now what is your petition? It will be given to you. And what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Esther replied, and you can see she's been thinking through her process. My petition and my request is this. If the king regards me with favor, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet. I will prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. Now what's important here is that the king recognizes there's something deeper going on with Esther. She hasn't answered his initial question. So now that they've been eating, he asks again. And again, Esther delays her answer. Because Esther wants to be sure that when she finally does lay the request at the king, she will be guaranteed the right kind of answer. And so the tension in the narrative is deliberately built up to then. She employs the language of the court when she uh, uh, delays this particular request. She will slowly reveal the detail. Her strategy is a a well-thought-through strategy in addressing the king. Instead of directly addressing the issue, she wants to have another meeting, another table, another feast, and then she will finally bring the request to the king. Why does she do this? So that she guarantees the right response. Let me read from one of the commentators. He put it like this. The delay of waiting for the next banquet may well increase the narrative tension, but it also means Esther has guaranteed, has a guaranteed response once she puts her request to the king. Great tact. You know, and can I say to you as Christians, we should also exercise great tact in our relationships with each other and in our relationships with others. 
I'm sure you've heard it said by people from time to time. I just tell it like it is. And that's a way of saying, well, you know, I don't care about the feelings of anyone. I'll just lay it on the line and say it however I want to say it. And I've learned over the years through my own mistakes, through getting it wrong at this level, that how you say something is much more important than what you say. And so it's important for us as Christians to think carefully, particularly when we're dealing with delicate matters or difficult matters, to speak tactfully, to think carefully of how we're going to say what we need to say, rather than just bombastically bursting forward and letting words tumble out of our mouths that may end up causing great hurt unnecessarily, rather than winning someone over through wisdom and tact. And then her wisdom is exhibited uh, or shows great faithfulness. Faithfulness to Mordecai, faithfulness to God's people, but more importantly, faithfulness to God. She has not compromised her faith. She has put everything on the line for God. She recognizes that even if she dies, even if it costs her her life, it's more important to be faithful to God than to compromise your convictions. It's more important to remain true to your, to your faith than it is to bow to the pressure to compromise for the sake of not having to deal with a sticky or awkward situation. Now, for most of us sitting here tonight, as I've said so many times from this pulpit, your faith is probably not going to require your life, but it may require your reputation. It may require that you allow your status to be affected by staying true to what you know to be true, by remaining faithful to God. It may result in people mocking you and laughing at you and avoiding you and talking behind your back because of your Christian stand. But the question we need to ask ourselves is to whom is it more important to be faithful? To my peers or to God? Who counts more? The stakes are high for Esther. And the stakes sometimes are high for us to remain faithful to God when under extreme pressure. And such faithfulness is bound up in our relationship with Jesus, who himself remained faithful to the end and endured the cross so that you and I could be saved. He could have simply said to the Lord, his father, I don't want to go through with this, not your will, but my will be done. But he doesn't. And on that cross, we are told that he could have called on 12 legions of angels. Listen to Matthew 26, verse 53. Do you think I cannot call on my father and that he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. Christ could have done that. And the reason he could have done that is because God was under no obligation to save us, but chose to save us freely out of grace and love. And in order for that to be accomplished, Jesus needed to remain faithful to the task to the responsibility God had placed on his shoulders. If Christ has remained faithful like that, how much more should you and I remain faithful to him when under pressure? What would you rather hear? The applaud of your peers in this world or the words of Christ in the world to come, well done, good and faithful servant. I know what I want to hear. How about you? And then secondly, I want you to notice the character of folly, verses 9 to 14. Now we're going to see how not to act as Christians. We're going to see the opposite of wisdom in folly. In complete contrast to Esther, Haman is a man full of pride. So proud is he that it allows, his pride overwhelms him to the point where he begins to act in foolish ways. 
He, it results in anger. Notice what he says. Haman went out on that day, happy to initially and in high spirits. But when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that he neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, he was filled with rage. He becomes so utterly angry that the anger blinds him to reality. And he allows the anger to cloud his judgment. And this anger ultimately results in him making an incredibly rash decision. And that rash decision is going to spectacularly backfire on him. He is overwhelmed by rage. The fury will lead him to accept the advice of his wife and friends. He will build a gallows 75 feet high. No one is not going to be able to see these gallows because they're so high. It's meant to be high so that everyone can see it because he's angry. Now let me ask you some uncomfortable questions. How often does an angry response cloud your better judgment. How many times have you been so angry of a situation that you've responded according to your anger and then walked away a few hours later with deep regrets of how you've spoken or how you've acted? Imagine Jesus before Pilate acting in anger and calling down the wrath of God or acting in anger when those people who were mocking him on the cross, who said to him, come on, if you're the son of God, come down off the cross. Imagine if Jesus in anger said, okay, you want me to do it? Watch this. But he doesn't. Folly of anger. It is presumptuous. He's so blinded by his fury that he doesn't even wait to ask the king, but just simply presumes that he can go ahead and build a, a gallows. He hasn't even gone to the king and asked. He simply cuts across any permission he might need. He assumes, incorrectly so, that he can just go ahead and do his own thing without first getting the king's permission. And he makes sure that these gallows are high, as I've already said, so that everyone can see. There is a presumptuousness to his folly. He presumes things. Have you ever, ever acted in a presumptuous way? That you've assumed things not in evidence, and you've acted and then discovered later that your presumption was completely incorrect? I know I have. It results in boasting. Look at his boasting. He calms down a little bit when he gets home. Let's read on. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home, so he's calmed down a little bit now. Calling together his friends and Zeresh, his wife, Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, and all the ways the king had honored him, and how he had elevated him above all the other nobles and officials. So here is great boasting. He boasts about his sons. He boasts about his wealth. What he hasn't taken into account is that God is at work behind the scenes, and all this wealth and all the family that he has is going to ultimately come to complete ruin. Everything he puts his confidence in is going to be completely stripped away. And Haman is going to lose his very life. And all his boasting is going to come to nothing. It reminded me of the parable of the rich fool who goes out and gets uh, inside after dark Puts, uh, says to his family, all my barns are full. I've got all of this stored up, all this great wealth. And Jesus says in Luke chapter 12, verse 16 to 20, if I can read it to you. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? The moment you and I begin to boast in our accomplishments, boast in what we have achieved, boast in what we have accumulated, 
boast in our abilities, boast in our skills, we fail to acknowledge that all of those things come as a gift of God's grace and we put ourselves in dangerous positions. Because whatever we have can be taken away by God in a moment's notice. Our health, our possessions, our families, our status, our friends. No, we adopt the words of the Apostle Paul who says, if I'm going to boast in anything, I will boast in the cross of Christ. That's where my confidence lies. That's what my boasting is in. It's in what Jesus has done for me. It's in the cross of Christ. All these other things, says Paul, they're worthless. They're worth nothing. Oh, that I might finish the race and be found in him. His folly is blinded by pride. He wrongly assumes that being invited, he's being invited because he's going to be honored. That's pride, is it not? It's pride in status. Look, he says to his wife and to his friends, look, I'm the only one who's invited. Aren't I special? Aren't I someone apart from everyone else? This is a status issue. I'm being accorded a status that no one else is being accorded because I alone am being invited into the king's presence to dine with him and the queen. Aren't I great? And yet it's that very banquet that he's being invited to that is going to result in his downfall and result in him being stripped of every semblance of pride. He thinks he's being honored, but in fact, it's going to cost him his life. 1 Samuel 2.30 makes this simple statement. God says, therefore, I will honor those who honor me. We should be more concerned about the honor of the Lord Jesus Christ than concerned with our own honor. It's not about me. It's not about how great I am or how, what status I achieve in life. It should be all about honoring God and bringing glory to his name. Do you know that I've served in a number of different churches and I've served with wonderful people in those churches I remember serving in a church with someone who just was one of these people, and we have them in this church as well. I don't want to mention names because I don't want to embarrass people here. But who just get along, and they just serve and serve and serve, and whatever you ask them to do, they just get on and do. No one sees half of what they do, but they just do it because they're not interested about promoting self. They're interested about promoting God. That's what God seeks. People who honor him, who don't seek honor for themselves. You know, this, I was watching a, I shouldn't watch these things. I was watching a, a video on Arnold Palmer. Now, do you know who Arnold Palmer is? I'm a golfer, sorry. I, for all of you who don't play golf, you think people who play golf are just dumb, you're right. So we are dumb. We chase a white ball around, and all I do is see the whole golf course because I go from this side to that side, and... I'm very good at finding golf balls now. But Arnold Palmer was uh, in the, it was the U.S. Masters, I think. And he was walking down the one fairway, and he was leading at that point. And a friend of his who was walking the fairway said to him, Arnold uh, took his hand, and I want to quote, he motioned over to me, this is 1961, and stuck out his hand and said, congratulations. I took his hand and shook it, but as soon as I did, I knew I'd lost my focus. On my next two shots, I hit the ball into a sand trap, into the bunker, and then put it over the edge of the green. That's where you aim for, for the, you who are not golfers. I missed the putt and lost the masters. You don't forget a mistake like that. You just learn from it. And become determined you will never do that again. I haven't in the 30 years 
since. The good thing about that is Gary Player won it, the South African. Pride. Be careful that you don't allow yourself for your pride to drive you, to allow yourself to get ahead of yourself, to allow yourself to think more highly than you should. Proverbs 16, 18, which is what I titled this. I could have titled it, Wisdom and Folly Contrasted. But pride goes before a fall. Have you ever said something like, you know, things are going so well and I'm in such a good place right now, only to wake up the next morning for some disaster to strike. And they normally come in threes. I don't know why. It's also self-centered. Notice, he is bent on destroying Mordecai. His wife, Zeresh, and all his friends said, have a gallows built 75 feet high and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then go with the king to dinner and be happy. This suggestion delighted Haman, and he had the gallows built. Here is a man who is so self-centered, that all he can see is his own happiness, his own joy. And what's so sad about this is that his self-centeredness is bound up in killing someone else, having someone else murdered, having someone else hung. He's so blinded by his own self-centeredness that all he's concerned about is that he gets his way and his will prevails. And his revenge is complete, even though it means Mordecai is going to lose his life. Of course, we know the end of the story, and Mordecai doesn't lose his life. But Haman nevertheless thinks in this process that this is the way to gain happiness. Then he can go and have dinner with the king. Then he can relax. Then he can enjoy dinner once his enemy is completely destroyed. And yet that self-centeredness that blinds him is going to be exposed in front of the king. When Esther says, do you know that this edict you issued on behalf of Haman involves me and the people I represent? The king didn't know. Because up until that point, Esther hadn't told him she was a Jew. And Haman is going to be embarrassed and find out in the presence of Esther and the king that his gamble has failed spectacularly. Contrast his self-centeredness with the other-centered approach of the Lord Jesus Christ who said, I did not come to uh, uh, serve myself but to serve others. I came to give my life as a ransom for many. Jesus who sought our good, our salvation, who put his own feelings aside so that you and I might find life. The epitome of everything that is other-centered and as believers, is that not our call? To be other-centered. It's not about what I want. It's not about my will prevailing. It's not about getting my way. It's about God's will. It's about God's purposes. It's about God's word. And so we are told in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, have you ever tried to put this one into practice? Consider others better than yourselves. Do we ever think like that? Or do we have the comparison game where we think, you know, I'm not that bad. I'm better than at least that person. Or do we consider others better than ourselves? The Son of Man did not come to seek accolades for himself. Did not come to promote his own self-interest, but at every point submitted to the will of the Father. And served us. 
And so as we think through the contrast that has been given here between wisdom and folly, where do we land on the scale? If we were to assess ourselves, where do we fall? Where do we land? So important that we allow God to work in and through us that we might demonstrate the same kind of wisdom as Esther and avoid the same kind of pitfalls of folly of Haman. What is the greatest folly of all? It's rejecting Christ, is it not? The greatest folly of all. For to reject Christ is to elevate oneself above him and say, I know more. I know better is to usurp the throne of God and to put yourself in the place of God and to become a little God. It is the ultimate insult to God to reject him and to turn away from him. And Jesus expresses that in his lament over Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets, how I long to gather you as a mother hen gathers her chicks. But you would not. Hopefully that does not describe any of you here this evening, that you would not come to Christ because of the stubbornness of your heart. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this wonderful reminder of the difference between one who acted with great wisdom and one who acted in great folly. Give us the grace that we lack but so desperately need to have the right kind of wisdom as we live out our Christianity in this dark and dying world. And may we avoid the pitfalls of folly so that we might exalt you at all points for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our final song.